Hello, and welcome to Bloody Violent History. My name is Tom Ashton, and with my old friend James Jackson, we're going to talk about moments from history that tell us who we are, how we got here, and perhaps where we're heading. And it's often violent and generally quite bloody. Welcome back to our section on objects from history, a hundred bloody objects. What do you have for us today, Jamie? Object number five, a baguette. Sacre bleu, why we hate the French. Hate is a very strong word, yet there can be no denying that the English and French share a thousand-year history of mutual antipathy and suspicion. Why else did we all give a silent cheer when the Sun newspaper ran its notorious headline, Up Yours, Delors? Or thrilled to George W. Bush's claim that the French were little more than cheese-eating surrender monkeys? Let's face it, there's been a lot of blood under the bridge and sprayed around the battlefield. So, Jamie, it isn't exactly a love match. Certainly not, Tom. As the Duke of Wellington said, we are... We have been, and I trust always will be, detested by the French. So as you say, there's a lot of mutual antipathy over the centuries. So what is it that has created this antagonism? It's both human nature and history, Tom. Let's deal with human nature first, because it really provides a framework for the sort of relations we've had with them over so many years. If you look at human nature, the first thing is, of course, the obvious, that humans are tribal, competitive, and prejudiced. It's what we are. A lot of people say, oh, there's universal love and peace and harmony. But actually, you don't have to look too far to realize that at the end of the hippie trippy rainbow, there's usually a Charles Manson. And at the other end, there's a Hell's Angel from the 1969 Altamont Festival carrying a knife. Yeah, I remember even in Forrest Gump, it was the hippie who ended up punching Forrest Gump's girlfriend in the face, and then Gump jumped on top of him and beat him up. But it's um, it was, I thought, a good moment in that film. Yes, one's always want to kick a hippie. But I've always said that if you scratch a liberal, there's usually a little Pol Pot waiting to jump out to hang you from a lamppost or send you to a re-education camp. And some of the most outward-looking, inclusive people you've ever met, actually you scratch the surface and you find that they're the most mealy-mouthed, judgmental, intolerant people that you've ever actually come across in your life. So it's just the way it goes. And so if you add things like a competition for natural resources, for gas, oil, water, for, dare I say, fisheries in the modern age, uh, or for gold or for power, or you add a religious dimension, humans are often ending up at each other's throats. And that's just the way it is. Yeah, so people define themselves by their dislike for their neighbour. Yes, that's the second reason. If you go back to biblical times, you remember the preaching and the parable of Jesus about the Good Samaritan. The reason that story exists is because the people of Jerusalem loathe the people of Samaria, the Samaritans, who live just a few miles north up the road. And it's existed for many reasons. I mean, partly because they had very different histories. The people of Jerusalem had been part of the kingdom of Judah, whilst the people of Samaria had been part of the kingdom of Israel. They had been in Jerusalem, deported to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC. The people of Samaria had been deported by the Assyrians a couple of centuries before that. The people of Samaria had their own sacred mountain. They didn't like the priestly cult of Jerusalem. So they were very different people. And what happens? The people of Jerusalem start thinking, oh, the Samaritans, they have better farming land. They're meanies. They're not known for their, for their pleasantness or their charity. And so that's why Jesus tells the story, the parable of the Good Samaritan. It was to make a point. And so you can see even then that people define themselves by their tribal structure, localism, and they don't like their neighbours. And that feeds into really the third point about human nature, is that we have a pre-existing notion, prejudice, about 
those neighbors. And what we do is we tend to select facts and bits of history that fit that construct. And if you look at our attitudes towards the French over the years, they think we're uptight, sexless, can't cook. We think they're lazy, cowardly, uh, that they have halitosis, and they're lacking in personal hygiene. Yeah, that Mickey Flanagan uh, joke, I should say, I guess. He thinks the only reason that they eat snails is they're so lazy, it's the only thing that they can actually catch. Yes, and going back to personal hygiene, there's always been that feeling that the French invented the bidet because they hadn't discovered the bath. So those prejudices sort of run very deep. And if you start looking at events that occurred, we seize on them. It's no accident that it was French Exocet missiles that sank British ships during the Falklands War. It's no accident that during the Kosovo campaign involving NATO, the French were leaking targeting information to the Serbians and allowing Serbians wanted for war crimes at The Hague to escape into the hinterland. And even today, there's absolutely no doubt there's French Navy and police collusion in allowing thousands of migrants to head in rubber dinghies and other sort of boats across the channel. They couldn't do that without some sort of official help in spite of denial by the French and in spite of the fact that we're paying the French to stop that happening. So all the way through, you see that sort of ambivalence towards the French, ambivalence towards the French authorities or the Paris authorities. All of this recalls the great patriotic 19th century historian Jules Michelet, explaining how important French animosity towards Britain was in French nation-building. The struggle against England has done France a very great service by confirming and clarifying her sense of nationhood. Through coming together against the enemy, the provinces discovered that they were a single person. It is by seeing the English close to that they felt they were France. It is the same with nations as with the individual. He gets to know and define his personality through resistance to what is different from himself. He becomes conscious of what he is through what he is not. Well, I think it would be useful at this point to just run down a couple of stats about how we've been in conflict with the French over the last thousand years. In the last 748 years, from 1066 to uh, the Battle of Waterloo, 1815, there have been 28 wars uh, between the French and the English, which perhaps doesn't describe fully the amount of time we spent fighting each other, because that does amount to, out of 748 years, 279 years we've been at war which is more than a third of that whole time we've been at war with the French. And we fought more with the French than with anyone else. Uh, it's fascinating that although the 20th century was dominated with conflicts with Germany, Germany had only existed for that 100 years, and therefore they're very recent enemies. It's the French that go much deeper. It's much more profound, in spite of the fact that we've obviously lost so many more people from conflicts with the Germans. And again, it's no accident that the only country with which we've had a 100 years war, which was actually 116 years, was the French. Yes, the 100 years war. That's Edward III. Yes. And we were talking earlier about defining yourself in terms of how much you hate your neighbours. Edward III is a classic example. And I've always thought that that's where it all begins. Because Edward III is really the first English king, the most English of kings. He was on the throne when English became the official court language. It was the time of Chaucer. It was the time of the longbow taking over the battlefield, becoming the capital weapon of the battlefield. And it was a time when our battles with the French involved small English armies taking on much larger French adversaries. So that tradition of the plucky Brit or the plucky Englishman was born of us fighting back and winning in very trying circumstances. That really started with Edward. If you look at England at the time, the Black Death created opportunities because it had wiped out so many people in, in England that 
you started seeing the rise of the middle class. You saw the rise of the wool trade. You saw us doing huge amounts of business with Flanders, for example, and our fleets trading with them, carrying our wool to them. The French wanted to get a piece of that action. So they started raiding us. They started encroaching on Edward's land in Gascony. He didn't like that. So he started raising taxes in order to go to war. And these were very popular wars. And again, it's the first time you start getting a professional English army. These weren't rabbles that were just scraped together from the provinces. These were people volunteering to go and fight the French. And so this sort of antipathy towards the French started around then and became very, very embedded in the English psyche. Okay, so there are 28 wars, but within those wars, in the last 750 years up to the Battle of Waterloo, there were many battles. And I think it's a good point now to just talk about a few of those, starting in the time of the Hundred Years' War. Yes, well, there was the famous Battle of Sluis, which involved 200 French ships coming against Edward's fleet that were carrying an army towards Flanders, and we absolutely smashed them. Yes, we did smash them. Um, we lost two ships and four to 600 men. Uh, they lost 190 ships, including 166 captured, and 16 to 20,000 men. So I could say we could chalk that up to the English. And we can really see that as the start of English naval victories that travelled on through the Nelsonian period. I mean, it, it's on a level with the sort of victories that Nelson was winning at... Trafalgar and St. Vincent and the Battle of the Nile, for example. So we have a long tradition of naval battles. And because we're a, a naval nation, because our empire was based on our naval strength, that again is how we defined ourselves in our victories against the French. But the battles on land too embedded themselves in the English psyche, embedded themselves in British history. And the first one was really the Battle of Cressy, and again, was a fantastic victory of a smaller English fort, well dug in and with the longbow. Uh, and that was the 26th of August, 1346. And Edward III has located his forces very well. The French cavalry charged. They always do. And a lot of them fell into pits that were pre-dug by the English. And those that weren't killed by longbows ended up being hacked to pieces when they were on the ground or lying at the bottom of these pits. And that was a magnificent victory for Edward. Yes, and, and just shortly after that, up in the north of England, of course, the Scots took advantage of us being occupied in France uh, by attacking. But luckily, the Percys were on hand. And at the Battle of Neville's Cross, uh, the King of Scotland was captured. But it, but it is worth pointing out that during the Hundred Years' War, the Scots fought on the side of the French. And at the next battle, the Battle of Poitiers, on the 19th of September, 1356, 10 years after the Battle of Cressy, um, that was handled by Edward, the Black Prince, son of Edward III, was another incredible triumph and, and actually more important than Cressy. It, it was up against uh, a much larger force, a, a force of French that were four times the size of the English. Just as at Cressy, when the Flems hadn't turned up, they had retreated earlier, the English stood alone. They had Gascons with them, they had some Bretons. Um, and some and, Welsh. And some Welsh, of course. The Welsh were very good bowmen. And that's really where the longbow first came from, actually, and was, was adopted into the English armoury. What happened was that Edward III placed his archers behind thickets near the forest and behind hedgerows. The French came on. And when the first wave retreated, they then smashed into the second wave and the third wave. The English cavalry went round the back and encircled them. And it ended up with the French king, King John II, and the Dauphin, his son, being captured. The French king offered up his right gauntlet uh, in surrender. And as we all know, surrender is a French term, is a Norman French term. We uh, shall never surrender. <laughs> And as has been pointed out, Churchill, years later, used Anglo-Saxon words for everything apart from the word surrender. OK, we come on to the third most famous battle of that period, the 25th of October, 1415. 
Agincourt. Well, that, of course, is another great English king, Henry V, who defined himself again in terms of his enmity of the French and as a great English king. And he carried on that tradition that Edward III had set. I mean, Edward III created the Knights of the Garter. He had the round table. So there was this sort of romantic chivalry involved. And once you add that to naked politics, of course, it gives it almost a feeling of holy war rather than just land grab. And Henry V, again, commanded a much smaller army after capturing the town of Harfleur. He was marching his army back to Calais to winter there. He couldn't cross the Somme. The French were offering terms, wanted to negotiate, but Henry V knew very well that this was a delaying tactic from the French so they could uh, reinforce their army. And so he decided to force the issue. We all know the story about him digging in stakes and about the French cavalry charging. And there were several thousand uh, French knights that charged up towards Henry. They were completely decimated. There's always been that story about Henry V ordering his prisoners to be killed. It's pretty likely that not so many, as have been mentioned, were actually slaughtered. But there's no doubt that Henry V was in a very difficult situation because the numbers of prisoners meant that he couldn't guard them and fight the oncoming French army and French knights at the same time. So he had to do something about it, although his knights would have found that extremely distasteful. But we all know the outcome. Henry V survived, he triumphed, and it's those three battles, Crecy, Poitiers, and Agincourt, that defined our relationship with the French for hundreds of years to come and embedded themselves, as I said, in our national consciousness. Also, King John of Bohemia, uh, he'd been blind already for 10 years, but he died at the Battle of Crecy when, at his command, his companions tied their horses' reins to his own and charged, and he was slaughtered in the ensuing fight. Well, can I just say, Tom, I'm blind and I wouldn't do anything quite so bloody stupid. You know, I, I, I might tie you to something and <laughs> send Probably. you off into battle. Probably a stake. <laughs> yeah, there's plenty of other gruesome ways. I, I wouldn't be talked into it by my mates to do, just do something like that. Just sit on this horse. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you going? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so this rivalry, this power play, went on for centuries between the English and the French. It did, and the battles just got bigger and bigger. Once you get to the 18th century, you got the battles dominated by John Churchill, the Duke of Marlborough, and they were on an incredible scale. If you take battles like Oudenarde, Blenheim, Ramillies, they, they were vast. I mean, Oudenarde, they, there were 160,000 people on the battlefield, and the casualties were huge. This was hand-to-hand fighting. And they were basically involved in the Spanish succession, and the Spanish were there as well. Eugene of Savoy was there alongside John Churchill, and they worked extremely well together. And it's quite strange that we ended up in alliance over Spain, but it was very effective. And again, it changed the fate and direction of our relations with France for a very long time. It's no accident that every time a French president comes over or a politician comes over to this country, we end up having to hastily scrub out or disguise the rooms in which they sit. And when the French president came over to Windsor Castle, they had to change the Waterloo chamber and call it the music room. <laughs> so this is what we constantly have to do whenever a French politician visits. So many of our iconic statues and monuments and memorials are down to our conflicts with the French. I mean, Trafalgar Square and Nelson's Column to name but two. Yeah, well, that actually brings us on to the the next period, which is the Napoleonic period. Yes, and if ever there was a time in which we defined ourselves by our loathing for our neighbours, it was that period, because it came after the French Revolution and the terror that occurred in France. And we rather smugly watched and thought, Aren't we lucky that we don't have that chaos? We don't have that anarchy. We don't have that barbarism. 
In fact, we were too busy doing our grand tours and hoovering up all the royalist and aristocratic furniture uh, that was put on the market during that period. It's why the Queen has Louis XVI's bedroom furniture, frankly. <laughs> well, I hope she enjoys it. <laughs> so it also amazed us then, and I think amazes us to this day, that the French could put on a pedestal and give a mausoleum to someone who is essentially the Hitler of his age. They think he's a glorious figure. But actually, if you look at the record of Napoleon, he butchered millions across Europe. He butchered his own army. I mean, you're talking about a man who lost 600,000 men in the retreat from Russia. You're talking about a man who had been trapped in Egypt after the Battle of the Nile and still managed to slip back to crown himself emperor and leave his army behind back in Egypt. He wasn't averse to betraying people, to letting them down, and then, of course, putting his rallies in positions of power across Europe. And that's not what we Brits do. And it's no accident that Napoleon became the bogeyman of that period. I mean, every cartoon, every children's cautionary tale, it involved Napoleon. That is, again, how we defined ourselves as a nation in terms of our hostility to the French and our hostility to Napoleon. Yes. And there's another reason why we don't like the French. They tend to back our enemies. Oh, they certainly do that. I mean, throughout history, it was really two things. It was the Scots that they backed. I mean, back in Edward III's day, of course, they gave sanctuary to Rob the Bruce's son and was supporting his claims against the English up in Scotland. The Dauphin was married to Mary, Queen of Scots in the 16th century. She, of course, was a great rival uh, for the throne of Queen Elizabeth I. So, again, it's that rivalry. It's the French will always be seen lurking in the background, trying to support the enemies of England. And particularly if you have... Gloriana, or if you have the great Virgin Queen who is being undermined by someone like Mary, Queen of Scots, it's not going to make the French best of friends with us. Yeah. And the American War of Independence. That was absolutely critical, uh, the French role in that. And, and you could particularly take figures like Lafayette, who, when he first went out in the late 18th century, he was only 19. And they made him a major general. I mean, it just demonstrates how they were scraping around, desperately trying to find people who could lead them or provide some sort of support. And Lafayette said, listen, I'll do it for free. You don't have to pay me. I'm just here as a volunteer. And there were a lot of French volunteers who went over at that time, along with eventually a French expeditionary force. Lafayette and the French forces were critical in defeating Cornwallis's army in Virginia and surrounding Yorktown. Lafayette was an extraordinary figure. I mean, I take my hat off to him and I have a sneaking regard for him. And even today, there's an American flag hanging over his tomb in France. So you can see that very strong connection. And without that French assistance, it's most unlikely that Washington would have had the forces or the capacity to push Cornwallis out to defeat his forces, uh, which were pretty powerful at the time. Stop the press. Jamie, was that you complimenting a Frenchman? Uh, very rare. It, it's, it's, a, it's a very rare thing. But yes, you did. It's interesting about Lafayette because he ended up writing a Declaration of Rights back in France but did it at the time of the revolution. Of course, they would have guillotined him as they guillotined his wife's family. But luckily, he fell into the hands of Austria and became a captive. So survived the French Revolution as a result. But it just shows that how good men can be caught up in a terror, can be caught up in the anarchy of what was going on in France at the time. And he survived. But I, I've always felt that Lafayette was a very principled man. He was a great friend of Washington's throughout his life. And when he went back to America years later in the 19th century, he was fated as a hero. And you can see why. Yep. Well, then after 1815 and 
uh, the Battle of Waterloo, there was a period of peace between the French and the English. And eventually we ended up in 1939 and the Second World War. Yes, as allies. And the myths and the legends on both sides continue. In spite of our alliance, there has always been that slight tension, that slight edge to the relationship. And you can see why. The first fly in the ointment, really, in terms of relations with the French, has got to be our attack on the Vichy French Navy on July the 3rd, 1940. The French had just signed an armistice with the Germans. Vichy was created. Britain was fighting on, and we could not allow the French Navy to fall into the hands of the Germans. They were the second largest navy around in the Med. They would have provided an instant fleet to the Germans. They would have caused us all manner of problems in terms of our campaign in North Africa, and also in keeping Malta alive, and could have gone on to attack Alexandria and helped German forces move in on our position in Egypt. So it had to be dealt with. When you get someone like Admiral Darlin giving his absolute word that he would not hand a single French ship over to the Germans, there was no way that Churchill could accept that. Darlin could have defected to the Free French. He chose not to. He wasn't in a position to give his word because the Germans would have simply taken the fleet. The, the Vichy French weren't going to fight Germany. They weren't going to keep their fleet corralled in Algiers for later use. It would almost certainly have fallen into the hands of the Germans. Darlin was pro-German. He was anti-British. He thought that the Brits were about to capitulate. And I think he was incensed when the Brits decided to fight on. So he started negotiating with the British, but the terms weren't acceptable. And I don't think there was any other way, just as we had to deal with the Italian fleet at Taranto uh, later in the year by attacking them with aircraft from our aircraft carriers. We had to deal with the French. So we sent our battleships and battle cruiser uh, and destroyers and frigates along. And we took the fleet at Oran, at Mez al Kabir, uh, by surprise. A French battleship blew up, and the final French casualties were pretty fearsome. I mean, they were almost 1,200 men. The Brits lost two men when a swordfish aircraft was shot down. And we had mined the harbour anyway, so it was very difficult for the French to escape, although a ship did get out. It had to be done. It had to be dealt with. But you can imagine that was the friction. That was the starting point and led to a huge rise in Anglophobia throughout France during that period. But you can see that the alliance that we had with the French was always going to have those sort of tensions. Later on, when Bomber Command had to bomb targets in France, later on when we ended up having to attack Caen after the D-Day landings, and there were thousands of French civilian deaths and Normandy deaths, that too was going to cause tensions. And it, it's never going to be easy in the middle of wartime. So you start with a French fleet, you then get uh, the French resistance. And again, there's always been this slight chippiness that without the input of the special operations executive, without having a base in France from which to resupply and hand agents and couriers and wireless operators into French territory, uh, there would never have been any sort of French resistance, any sort of effective French resistance. And again, underlying it all, there's always been a bit of scepticism about the role of the French resistance. The French government chose to build this myth, this legend about how effective they are. But if you look at French government figures, they claim about 200,000 French people were actively involved in the resistance. The real figure is probably closer to 75,000. And that means you're talking about less than 0.2% of the French population. And that's before you even get on to whether they were effective or not. And French historians actually have a term for this exaggeration of the importance of the French resistance during the war. 
and exaggeration by various people of their role in the French resistance during the war. And actually what marked so much of the French resistance story was collaboration and treachery. And the word is? Resistance realism. Say it again. Resistance realism. Let's have it a third time. Resistance realism. Remember that word, folks. Yeah, and that's why neither of us did very well in French show level. <laughs> and, and let's face it. it hey, it's I a, got a B. <laughs> I got a C. But let's face it. It's the fact that it's a tricky language for the English that also gives that sort of divide, gives that special distance between the two nations. We find Italian a much easier thing to do. And actually, even though you feel like a complete cretin putting on an Italian accent in an Italian restaurant when ordering food, it still doesn't sound as bad as a Brit putting on a French accent when speaking French. I know someone who walked past him to Mrs. Thatcher once in the Alps and said, Bonjour, Madame Thatcher. And she went, Bonjour, dear, and walked on. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we've never been very good at the language, even though we pretend to be. So We, we like certain terms. Yes, we do. Like economic with the actuality. <laughs> yes. So you have the attack on the French fleet in 1940. You have the myth of resistance. And then you have individuals who claim to have been involved in the resistance. You have people like Francois Mitterrand, who actually were mid-level functionaries in the Vichy government, who rather strangely was involved in the reorientation of prisoners in spite of having escaped from German captivity himself. And you wonder, how did he get that position in the Vichy government? Of course, they all claim, oh, but I was working for the resistance all along. I had many contacts in the French resistance. But then you discover that Francois Mitterrand was also writing articles that were used for propaganda purposes in the French press by the Vichy authorities. So it's always a little murky. It's always a bit strange. And then, of course, there's de Gaulle. And have anyone exaggerated the importance of the French? It was he. He got into Paris in August 1944, and he gave a speech from the Hotel de Ville in Paris. And it's remarkable, if you look at that speech, how little he mentions the Allies. He claims that Paris liberated itself. He claims that a mighty French army was coming up the Rhone Valley. He claims that it would be the French that were in the vanguard of invading enemy territory. And then he just, as an aside, mentions assistance by the Allies. And it's worth remembering that on the Normandy beaches, so in that first wave of Allied forces coming ashore at Normandy, there were in fact only 177 French troops. So de Gaulle was a great one for dismissing the efforts of the Allies, certainly of snubbing and dismissing the efforts of the English and the Brits. So so forget Entente Cordiale, there was always great frostiness. And I think Bomber Harris, one of the few people he didn't want coming round to Bomber Command, was de Gaulle. Yes, he was. Uh, him and uh, Churchill's son were the two people he least liked entertaining at Bomber Command. Well, and I think de Gaulle and Randolph Churchill were two of the least likable people, so you can see why. To reinforce that point, this is what de Gaulle said when we were trying to join the common market in the 60s. Our hereditary enemy, it was not Germany, but England. I'm not going to let him have the last word, Tom. I think it's worth reminding people that when the Bourbons, the French royal family, were reinstated post the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, the French national flag became white. So all I want to say is, Shades of things to come. The strange thing is, the French even hate themselves. Yes, they do. A sibling of mine had a French godmother, and her favourite saying was, uh, I would never live in France because they're just as bloody as I am. Oh, it's great French accent there you got, Jamie. Yeah. Did, could you tell I'm, can you tell I'm fluent? <laughs> yeah, in, in your dreams. <laughs> Okay, but there are exceptions to the rule, I think. Like all rules, there's an exception. A great hero of mine is Michael Montaigne, who suffered a great deal 
uh, with kidney stones, amongst other things. Um, and anyone who can write fantastic essays on the classics and cannibals deserves some praise and attention. And he was the mayor of Bordeaux, and his eyes tended to turn towards Britain and Ireland, or England and Ireland, in those days. And he had a feral hatred, like most of the people in Bordeaux, for Paris, because they were the imposers of tax. So I'd say Montaigne was not a hater and not a man to be hated. And our trade with Bordeaux continues uh, to this day. Uh, my favourite uh, being uh, Leoville Barton wine, owned by a Protestant Irish family, the Barton family, who avoided, uh, even after nine generations, having to split up their estate by very sensibly not marrying any French women. And while Ronald Barton fought with the Royal Inniskillen Fusiliers in World War II, but the level of resistance in Bordeaux was an example of paucity. And they were known to say, to fight, some locals said, was impossible, since the land was too flat to have an underground. But I can forgive them for great claret. And that's worth celebrating. And there were some very brave individuals, but for every brave individual, there were so many who were in hoc to the authorities, in hoc to Vichy, who wanted to keep their heads down. And who knows if we would have behaved any differently, but I like to think that we would come up with a better figure than 0.2% in terms of the number of people actively involved in resistance. Well, we did carry on the fight. We certainly did. And I think that's another reason why the French have never forgiven us. Well, I was looking at an article produced by the BBC just recently, and I mean, it does continue to this day. Uh, we have a problem with the French like they have a problem with us. This, this article is why the French are European champions of abandoning pets. Between 100 and 200,000 animals, pets, are abandoned in France every year, um, as opposed to the English, it's 16,000. And the reasons given are because they are no longer fashionable, the pet that they purchase, rather like a mobile phone, it gets uh, dated. They are an impulse buy. The French are so used to everything being paid for by the state that they're shocked to discover that they actually have to pay their own vet fees. And they tend to have other very uh, unconvincing reasons for abandoning their pets, such as going on holiday, finding a new partner, moving house or having a baby. So, Jamie, do we have a postscript? Yes, we do, Tom. I have a French neighbour, so the war continues. There goes our subscriber base in France. Frankly, it's no surprise that we call condoms French letters and they call them the capote anglais. Thank you, James. Thanks, Tom. So it goes. My name is Tom Ashton. His name is James Jackson. You can view images relating to each podcast on our Bloody Violent History Instagram account and on our website, bloodyviolenthistory.com. Please subscribe, it's free, to our podcast on the app you use and to our mailing list via our website. This is very important as it boosts our rankings in the podcast charts. Thank you and good luck. Good luck.